Hi everyone and welcome to lab number eight. Today's experiment is going to focus on ligation and in insertional inactivation, which all sounds very fancy and complex, but I believe it will be rather simple for you to understand because you're already experts in the previous lab, which dealt with a similar plasmid and a similar background concept and you know, today's experiment relies a lot on transformation as well. So, you know, your your baseline information that you already have, your, your foundation is really going to help you a lot through today's lesson. Now, when we talk about today's lab, today's experiment, you're basically going to end up engineering recombinant DNA. And I want you to be very comfortable whenever you hear the term recombinant DNA. That's simply a fancy way of saying basically combined DNA. DNA that has parts from more than one organism. Now, I'm not saying, you know, more than one species. It doesn't have to be two different species. It's just two different organisms, two different pieces of DNA that have been put together. Sometimes, yes, it is from more than one um, species. Sometimes it's just from, for instance, two different E. coli, you know, for, for a basic example. Now, whenever you're dealing with making recombinant DNA, we call that molecular cloning. Now, a lot of students get confused because when you think of cloning, you think of sci-fi movies or Dolly the Sheep, but molecular cloning doesn't necessarily just mean making a copy of an organism. Molecular cloning is actually the process in which we end up copying or cloning and manipulating DNA, okay, and making recombinant uh, molecules of DNA. Now, whenever you're going to do molecular cloning or create recombinant DNA, I want you to think of four main steps. There's restriction, ligation, transformation, and detection. And half of these steps you're already experts at, right? The, the last two. But we first start off with restriction. Restriction is basically cutting of the DNA. So you see here in this figure, you start off with a plasmid and you cut it open. Okay. Now in this visual, they cut it twice, but a lot of times we just cut it once to open it up. Okay. You also have a gene of interest, which is taken from a, another genome. So you have the plasmid full of genes, and then you have a gene of interest from a separate genome, but it's been cut with the same restriction enzyme as you cut your plasmid. So now you can easily ligate that gene of interest, meaning glue it into your plasmid that you cut open. Okay, we're going to go through these steps in more detail throughout today's lesson, but this is just the general idea. You cut your plasmid, you cut a gene of interest from a different organism, okay, from a separate genome, okay, you cut that with the same enzyme and you glue them together. Then you take that plasmid, that recombinant DNA molecule, recombinant because it's a mixture of two different pieces of DNA, the plasmid and the gene of interest, and then you transform or perform transformation. And as you already know, the purpose of transformation is to get that new DNA into a bacterial cell, which can then be cultured so that the bacteria replicates and makes a lot of copies of that DNA, that recombinant DNA. And then the last step is detection, which in last week's lesson, we used the antibiotic resistance detection, as well as the color change, those blue colonies. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with understanding what we mean by recombinant DNA. So for instance, this here, this piece of plasmid with a gene of interest in it is now recombinant DNA. And make sure you're clear about the four steps of molecular cloning, restriction, ligation, transformation, and detection. And I just want to point out that when we mention restriction, that restriction is performed with 
nucleases. Okay, you're going to see that term again later. Nucleases are simply enzymes that cut nucleic acids. Okay, so nucleases cut DNA in the case of our experiments. Okay, so make sure to circle star highlight that term. Now, when we talk about genetic engineering, all of this that we're talking about is being able to cut and manipulate DNA. So remember we said nucleases are the enzymes that we use to cut DNA. And there are exonucleases and endonucleases. So if you think of what does exo mean, well that means outside, right? So exonucleases will cut at the end of a sequence, okay? whereas endonucleases will cut in the center, okay, within the sequence. So now, with these exo and endonucleases, keep in mind earlier I said that each of these nucleases will recognize a particular sequence, which is usually a, uh, a palindromic sequence, um, and it will only cut at that particular sequence. And each enzyme will have a different sequence a lot of times. And like I said, if that sequence is only once in the, the DNA, then that enzyme will only cut once. If it's five times in that DNA, the, the enzyme will cut every single time it sees that sequence. Now, there are two terms I want you to know the difference between. So circle star highlight these because these are two of my favorite words in the English language. We have isoschismers and we have neoschismers. And both of these are terms for nucleases, but how they differ, okay? The trick that I use to remember which is which, I think of neoschismers because whenever you hear neo, neo means new, okay? So new means that neoschismers are two enzymes that will recognize the same sequence of DNA, but will cut at different spots, okay? So they recognize the same palindrome, but will cut at different spots. For instance, one may cut here. So look over here. One may cut the sequence after the G, whereas the other enzyme, the neoschismer of that first one, will cut after the A or after that A. So they both recognize the same sequence, G-A-A-T-T-C, but they cut at two different places. Okay. Now, isoschismers, on the other hand, it's a little confusing when I say this, they recognize the same sequence and cut at the same spot. So isoschismers would both recognize G-A-A-T-T-C, and they would both cut after the G. Okay? That would be isoschismers. Now you may ask, well, if they're both recognizing the same sequence and they're both cutting at the same spot, why did they have two different names, such as enzyme A and enzyme B? That, that makes no sense. Well, it makes sense in that they were extracted from different organisms. So let's say you found enzyme A out here on, on the you know soil surface, and you found enzyme B out in an organism in the ocean. Well, yes, they do the same thing, but you name them different things because they're found in different places. And it's so important to know isoschismer and neoschismer because, for instance, if you're ever in you know, medical usage or, or research field, you run out of a particular enzyme. Well, if you know the isoschismer or the neoschismer, you may have access to it, right, without having to delay your work or run out and order something new. Okay, so make sure you know the difference between isoschismer and neoschismer. If you're having trouble, just contact me on Remind and I will give you examples. Again, I will draw them out if you would like. The other point that I want to make about nucleases is that 
they'll cut the DNA either using a sticky end or a blunt end. And you can see that in this top figure here. So if an enzyme cuts straight down and there's no overhang, as you can see here, that's a blunt end. Whereas if it cuts like this, cuts after that G, cuts after that G, well, now you have that little bit of overhang when they separate. And those are considered sticky ends because think about it. This T is all by itself now, and it's going to want to find an A, okay, to stick to. So that's why they're sticky because they like to grab a hold of other single strands. And sticky ends tend to work the best for research because think about it, it's sticky, it wants to bind. Okay, so at this point, you are now experts in terms of cutting the plasmid, cutting that DNA, you know, around the gene. So our ultimate goal in this experiment would be inserting the gene of interest into the vector, which is the plasmid. And in order to do this, you would want to cut the vector, which is your plasmid, and the gene of interest with the same restriction enzyme, the same nuclease. Now, when you do this, there's certain rules you have to keep in mind. Now, the first rule that you have to keep in mind is you want to cut the vector only once. Okay, so in terms of drawing that idea out, if you have the vector, you only want to cut it once. That way, uh -huh, that looks like a Q. What that was supposed to be is the plasmid that you're cutting only once. That way, you're just opening up the vector because those once you make that cut, the pieces of DNA around that cut then move away from each other. Okay, so it goes from a Q into a C and you can glue in your gene of interest there. Now, if, however, you had cut it more than once, that's going to be a problem. Okay, cut vector only once because if cut more than once, what would then happen? You would chop up. It chops up the plasmid and that would render it completely useless to you because picture that if you have the plasmid and you cut it multiple times let's say three times well now you have three separate fragments that are just going to all float away from each other they're going to be useless to you you can't glue in a gene in that area now the next thing that you'll want to keep in mind you also, you also want to avoid cutting any genes that are necessary for vector stability or survival. So also avoid cutting any genes necessary for vector 
ability or survival. Because if you cut into any gene, you ultimately make that gene inactive. Okay, you destroy the plasmid's ability or the bacteria's ability to then, you know, uh, replicate that gene, to then transcribe and translate it into an actual product. So you don't want to accidentally cut any of the genes that that bacteria would need in order to maintain and use that plasmid or in order to, you know, protect itself, help itself get through, you know, whatever functions it needs. So you always want to be careful where in the plasmid sequence you're cutting. So in order to avoid these kind of problems, so to avoid problems, what they've done is they've engineered or modified many vectors in order to contain what's called a polylinker or multiple cloning site. So to avoid problems, modified or engineered vectors to have what's called a polylinker also known as a multiple cloning site, which sometimes you see as MCS. Okay, and that's basically a fragment on the plasmid that's just made up of a whole bunch of restriction enzyme recognition sites so that you have the ability to pick and choose exactly which enzyme you want to use for your experiment and to safely know exactly where it's cutting, that it's cutting in an area that is not essential to that plasmid. And it also lets you know that it's only going to cut once so you're not destroying the plasmid. Okay, so the MCS is very valuable and I'm going to show you on the next slide exactly what that looks like. Okay, so in the meantime, just want to give you the rest of the writing on here. So please keep in mind those things that we just discussed, the idea that you only want to cut the vector once, that you do not want to cut any essential genes, and the fact that there is a polylinker to help prevent this. Polylinker or multiple cloning site. Circle star, highlight those terms, that way you recognize them and what exactly that that's is the purpose of a polylinker. The purpose is to avoid the problems that we just discussed. And then once you know that you have cut the plasmid properly and that your uh, gene of interest has been cut out of the organism's genome properly, you then use DNA ligase, which is an enzyme that glues together pieces of DNA. This slide here is to show you what I meant by the polylinker and by the process that we just talked about. Okay, so it helps you visualize. Now, keep in mind, not all plasmids will have that insert or the, um, the, the polylinker. And ligation is not always perfect, okay? When you do this process, not every vector is going to get cut open. Not every vector is going to get the intended gene. Because remember in lab we had mentioned that when you do this type of uh, experiment, when you cut that vector open and then you put it with these DNA pieces that you want to stick into there, well look at these. These guys also want to stick back to each other. They match. So a lot of times when you do the experiment, a lot of your plasmids will actually re-ligate on each other and not have the insert. So basically you need to make sure that there are ways for you to detect which plasmid successfully got cut open and actually took in the gene of interest, okay, which you see here with the plasmid and the gene of interest, rather than just sticking to themselves. So now on this slide, we're going to start going into some ways that you can detect whether your plasmid uh, 
successfully took in the gene of interest. Now keep in mind, this is different from the selectable markers we talked about earlier. Things like color detection and um, antibiotic resistance, that was just to show if your plasmid has made it into the bacteria. And that doesn't tell you whether or not your gene made it into the plasmid. Because remember, some of the plasmids will just stick to themselves, okay, rather than taking in the gene. So to try and determine whether your plasmid has successfully taken in the gene, you can do a few things. One thing that you can do is you can isolate from the bacteria, pull out the plasmid DNA, and you cut it with the same enzymes that you used in cloning. And think about it. If you look at this picture on the bottom of the slide, if you isolate plasmid DNA from the bacteria and you cut it with the enzymes from cloning, if that plasmid only re-ligated to itself, which is this guy here, then when you cut it with that enzyme, it'll only cut once and you'll see one linear strip of DNA. If, however, it took in the insert successfully, when you now cut it with the enzyme, look, that's one, two cut sites, right? So now when you run this on a gel, you'll see one, two pieces of DNA instead of one linear piece. Okay? If you have trouble visualizing that, just send me a remind message and I'll go over it in a little more detail. Okay, so what we just covered here, if you want to detect an insert in the plasmid, one way is to just simply extract the, DNA, the plasmid DNA and cut it with the same enzyme. If you see one band of DNA, then it is linear. It did not take in the insert. If you see two bands of DNA, then it did take in the insert it successfully took in the insert. Another thing that you can do is insertional, insertional inactivation, which is what you did in laboratory if you, you perform the blue and white uh, ligation transformation technique. And so we're gonna go over that one in more detail in the coming slides. And then you have the option to do order genes which kind of a lot of times we combine with insertional inactivation because the reporter genes basically let you visualize things. So these are things like color changes, like seeing blue color of colonies or white color of colonies. Okay. So this is the insertional inactivation method of trying to see if your um, bacteria successfully took in the insert or the new gene. Okay, this is basically what you see in the blue and white ligation transformation experiment. So you have this plasmid over here. Okay, in this example, it's not the blue and white case. In this example, the plasmid will have two different antibiotic resistance genes. Okay. This top one is antibiotic resistance for ampicillin, for instance. This bottom one is amp, um, antibiotic resistance for canamycin, for instance. Okay, so amp resistance and can resistance. Now, if you successfully cut open this vector and insert a gene, well, what do you notice? That gene just destroyed the canamycin resistance, okay? So any bacteria that has a plasmid that simply re-ligated on itself and never took in a gene, they'll still have AMP and canamycin resistance. If, however, it took in the new gene, it'll have AMP still working, but it will not be canamycin resistance. Okay, so in that case, what you would basically do is you would stamp the colonies that you got from this experiment on two different plates because we have the ability to just stamp them, meaning you put a, a velvet cloth, you pick up your colonies from your transformation, 
and you gently touch it on an ampicillin plate and you gently touch it on a canamycin plate. And you look to see which of those colonies from your transformation plate successfully grow on ampicillin, but then die off in canamycin. And you still have the original transformation plate to go back and take those colonies and grow them and use them for your experiment because they have the uh, intended gene. Okay, so let's draw this out to help you visualize what we were just talking about on the previous slide. So we had the vector that on one side had the gene for AMP resistance, and on the other side had the gene for CAN resistance. Okay, and then in insertional inactivation, your gene of interest would be pasted in directly in the middle of the CAN canamycin resistance. So you would put the gene of interest, which then disrupts the canamycin. So you can kind of draw out for yourself that you would have broken can and broken canamycin. So the way that you would kind of identify which of the colonies successfully took in the, the gene of interest is basically kind of counterintuitive to what you usually do. So if the bacteria took in the plasmid, well then you have your original transformation plate and let's just draw some potential colonies. So I'll put colony, these are all bacterial colonies. Okay, so this is your original transformation plate. Okay, so you know the exact location of your different colonies. And then what you would do is you would stamp those colonies using the velvet technique that I mentioned or various other ones that now exist. You would stamp a copy of that on to LB AMP. So this is an ampicillin uh, containing plate and LB canamycin plate. And you'll see which colonies grow. Now notice that in the experiment, whether it's the original plasmid, which we have over here, or whether it's the one that took in the gene of interest, either way, ampicillin does not get affected, the ampicillin resistance. So any of those bacteria that took in the plasmid, whether it's the original plasmid or the broken uh, gene of interest plasmid, then you should have those five colonies still perfectly healthy and surviving on ampicillin. Then you look at the canamycin plate, and what you might notice is you still have some of those colonies but what happened? Suddenly the colony that was here and the colony that was there do not survive canamycin. What does that tell you? It tells you those two missing colonies successfully took in the gene of interest. 
And so, like I said before, you know, it's counterintuitive. You're like, well, but they're not there. They died. What good are they? Those were just copies. What you then do is you go to your original plate, and I'll circle it in a different color. You would grab this colony, and you would grab that colony. And you would take a loop, touch it to each, you know, to one of those colonies, and grow it into a culture. And now you know that that culture has your gene of interest. Okay, if any of this is unclear to you, just send me a message in Remind App, and I will go further into detail. Okay, so now let's get into the specifics of our particular experiment, which we call the blue and white insertional inactivation transformation. I know it's a mouthful, but like I said, now that you understand transformation from last week and you understand, for instance, the production of blue colonies and bacteria, it'll kind of be a little easier to understand this lesson. Now, the first thing I want to mention is that we are using a different vector from our previous transformation. Our current vector is called PUC8. So that's PUC8. It is 2,700 base pairs in size, and it is a multi-copy plasmid. It's important to know these types of things when you're going into an experiment, because first of all, knowing that it's 2,700 base pairs is important for when you try to visualize your plasmid on gel electrophoresis, okay? That basically means that you'll be able to know exactly where to find it on the gel, and you'll be able to know whether or not, you know, for instance, when you mini prep it, when you do ligation experiments with it, you'll be able to really uh, keep track of that plasmid. It's also important to know that it is multi-copy because what multi-copy means is this plasmid will be able to replicate itself multiple times within the bacteria and it won't have to wait for the bacteria to, you know, do the usual replication of DNA right before mitosis. Okay, we describe it as not replicating in step with the bacteria. So some plasmids, if they replicate in step with the bacteria, it means you only get one copy of the plasmid in the bacteria at a time because then it will double the plasmid when the bacteria is going to be splitting or going undergoing cell division, and each bacteria would only get one copy of the plasmid. With multi-copy plasmid, it could just make a whole bunch of copies of that same plasmid in the single bacterial cell, which is great for your experiments because it means you get extra product. Again, like I said previously, it lets you use the bacteria as a factory. It's also important to note that PUC8 has a single recognition site for ECO-R1 endonuclease. So ECO-R1 is simply the name of a particular nuclease. Okay, as you see in the figure here, this is the sequence that it cuts at, that AATT sequence. And it's important to know that your plasmid has a single recognition site for ECO-R1 because that means that you will be able to cut open the plasmid like we showed in the previous slides without chopping it up. So it's very valuable for a ligation experiment. So now, like we said, this time we're using PUC-8, okay, different from our previous experiments. And in this experiment, PUC-8 has two selectable markers. Now, don't get mixed up because these selectable markers may sort of look similar to the ones you've seen before. Okay, so first off, it has the selectable marker for beta-lactamase, which you already know. What does that do? That gives antibiotic resistance. Specifically, which one? penicillin and ampicillin family of antibiotics. So in our experiments, you look for AMP resistance, meaning that bacteria with PUC8 in them can survive ampicillin, meaning plates that are labeled LB-AMP or LB-AMP-XGAL. 
Now the other gene may look sort of familiar, but it's a little bit different, okay? The second selectable marker of PUC8 is the alpha part of the LAC-Z gene, okay? And LAC-Z, which you've seen previously, we didn't call it LAC-Z, we simply said the gene for beta-galactosidase, which is LAC-Z. But now instead of having the whole gene for beta-galactosidase, this plasmid only contains the alpha part. And in order to have functional beta-galactosidase, a bacteria needs the alpha part plus the omega part. Okay, so it's basically pictured as two halves of the enzyme that then interact together to, full, to, to fully work. Okay, so you need the alpha part and the omega part to successfully work. So that will be important when I draw out exactly how we use the selectable marker in the next slide. Okay, so let's draw some of this out to help you visualize what's going on here. Like I mentioned, the bacteria, so the bacteria makes what we call the omega half of beta-galactosidase. So you can kind of picture it like this. Okay, so that's just the the omega half, and then what does the plasmid do? The plasmid then gives the bacteria the ability to make the alpha half of the enzyme. So you can kind of picture it drawn out like this. Again, that's the alpha half of beta-galactosidase. And then what happens is in that bacteria that has the plasmid, well, now that bacteria has made the omega half and the beta half, and then in the bacteria, the halves interact. Which you can visualize like this, as if they're little puzzle pieces. Okay, and so now that's to give the bacteria a fully functional beta-galactosidase. So to give fully functional beta-galactosidase. And now, as you know, you can tell when there's fully functional beta-galactosidase because that's when you see the blue colonies that you saw in your transformation um, in the previous labs that we did. So blue colonies on any of the X-gal containing plates. So now let's go a little further and delve into our particular experiment to kind of visualize what's going on in terms of plasmid. So here in our experiment, we have that plasmid, the PUC8 plasmid. As you saw in the previous slides, on one end, it has the AMP or ampicillin resistance. And then over here, it has what you might see places as lac z prime okay that's basically known as the alpha fragment of beta galactosidase <clears throat> now within that fragment right over here what that is is the eco r1 cut site okay directly in that alpha fragment so now, when the plasmid is perfectly normal and you have not cut at that cut site, 
then any bacteria containing this plasmid will be able to produce the alpha fragment. Okay, so produces alpha fragment. And then what did we just say on the previous slide? Bacteria produces the omega fragment. And then what happens? They interact. And you can tell that you have fully functional beta galactosidase because then there are blue colonies in the presence of X gal on any plate. Now, sorry, the pen does that sometimes, but that says X gal. Now, if the ligation that you want to do in this experiment works, so that's going to be down here, if ligation works, then what that means is that you still have the part of the plasmid that has the amp R, but now what happened over here on this side of the, the plasmid is you then cut open that E. coli R1 site and you glued in, you ligated right here, I'm coloring this in, the gene of interest. So for instance, that could be any foreign gene that you wanted the bacteria to make multiple copies for you, such as for instance, the gene for insulin production. Now what you did by putting that gene in that location, you now split apart that LAC-Z alpha gene. That gene is no longer functional because you just put a code right smack in the middle of it. So when the bacteria goes to read that DNA, that plasmid, It'll read the gene of interest, but it will no longer read the proper LAC-Z gene. So as we did in a previous slide, I'm going to show that this over here is now broken. Broken LAC-Z prime. And over here is the other half broken LAC-Z prime. So that tells you that now if the ligation works, Okay, if the ligation works, well then now you, sorry, I'm just changing pen color for you. You now, because you broke LAC-Z over here, right, by gluing in your gene of interest, LAC-Z prime is now destroyed. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means bacteria cannot produce the alpha fragment. So that means no alpha fragment. And what does that mean? No functional beta galactosidase. And so now, if there's no functional beta galactosidase, what does that mean? That tells you no blue colonies. And it's funny that I wrote that in blue. I probably should have, you know, swapped colors and had blue colonies before. Uh, sorry, blue writing where you did get blue colonies. But that means no blue colonies. So instead, this is when you will see white colonies. So what that means, this is actually the successful result here, okay? So white colonies here, and I'll change the color yet again, this is the successful result. Your goal is the white colonies because that tells you that you successfully glued in to the plasmid your gene of interest and it is now properly in the bacteria where it you know that gene of interest is getting produced instead of the beta galactosidase gene okay so please keep in mind white colonies are the successful result blue colonies 
are if there is no gene of interest present. Okay, so blue colonies are our control, which you'll see in the protocol a little later. Okay, so you can even write that for now. Um, up top somewhere, you can put control. So when you see blue colonies, they'll either be re-ligated plasmid or control plasmids, which you'll see later on. But blue colony tells you no gene of interest, no insert, no gene of interest. Okay. So I know there's a lot written on the slide now when you look at it, but if you took notes step by step, um, you can rewind, pause, kind of jot down the notes. It becomes a little bit clearer. Again, if you are unclear about the difference between when you see blue colonies versus when you see white colonies, please send me a message in Remind app and I will help clarify it even further. So now let's go over what exactly ligation is in our experiment, because we keep mentioning the term. So I want to make sure you're comfortable with what is actually happening in our experiment that we're discussing all throughout this, uh, this lab lesson. So when we talk about ligation, well, what does that mean? That basically means that you are gluing together or sealing together pieces of DNA. So I'll use the term gluing just because it makes it easier for students to understand. You're gluing or sealing together the DNA fragments. Okay. Now, in order to do that, you use a ligase. And ours in this experiment is called T4 DNA ligase. Okay. And what that actually does is it catalyzes phosphodiester bonds between nucleotides. So fancy way of saying it, it um, catalyzes the linking together uh, or formation of bonds between DNA bases that have, you know, been separated or cut. Okay, so DNA ligase is an enzyme that catalyzes, I'm going to use the fancy word, but you don't have to memorize that word, phosphodiester bonds. And when we say between nucleotides, that basically means between, you know, the, the nitrogenous base pairs. So your A's, T's, G's, and the C's that are right next to each other. Okay. Now, in order to do that, because it's an enzyme, it needs a couple of things. So when I say what does that T4 DNA ligase need, it needs ATP, right, because it needs energy. And it needs magnesium. I want you to circle star highlight magnesium because that's what we call a cofactor. Okay, cofactors, I always have students think factor as in factory so that you picture a factory, this big building and, and blocks and smoke because cofactors are inorganic. Okay, they're metals, they're minerals that help activate enzymes. So magnesium, you'll see, comes up in a lot of experiments as being required for enzymes like ligase or polymerase to actually function. Okay, so it's very important to remember cofactors and magnesium. Now, the last question that I mentioned about T4 DNA ligase is what affects the efficiency? And what affects the efficiency is the concentration. So let me clear everything so you can see this a little better. When I answer that question, it's the concentration 
of the vector, so meaning how much plasmid you put into that sample, and the concentration of the insert, meaning how much, you know, how high of a DNA concentration, how much of that gene of interest do you put into the sample. So what affects the efficiency is concentration, a vector, which is plasmid, and insert, okay? So the more vector, more insert you have, the better off you'll be, but if you put too much of either of them, it ends up hurting the efficiency, okay? Uh, think of it as ultimately in that little sample tube, you want those genes of interest, those little gene of interest DNA fragments to find the vector, to be able to find that opening in the vector and glue themselves to it. Now, when you do this kind of ex experiment, there is the possibility during ligation of what we call re-ligation. Okay, so there's the possibility, again, I'm gonna clear the slide for you. There's the possibility that the plasmid that you just cut open, so as you can see in this picture here, when you cut open the plasmid, instead of one of the fragments going in there, it's possible for the DNA on each side of that opening to now re-ligate to each other. Because you already know that they're matching pairs. They're, you know, they were already stuck together. They want to be stuck together again. So sometimes the plasmid, instead of sealing in one of the DNA fragments, it might re-ligate to itself. So what is a possibility? Possible that the cut plasmid may re-ligate to self instead of insert. And how can we detect for that? How will we know if that happens? Well, if it re-ligates to itself, right, then it didn't take in a new gene. So there's nothing blocking that lac Z prime gene, right? If it re-ligates to itself, it made the lac Z prime gene whole again, which means that the beta galactosidase is gonna end up functional. And how do you visualize that? You will see blue colonies instead of the white colonies of the, the gene being inserted. Okay, so how can we detect for that? Blue colonies. And make sure you understand why. Okay, they're blue, not because they're sad. They're blue because when the plasmid re-ligates to itself, it makes the beta galactosidase gene whole and active again, okay? And the last question that I mentioned here is what do we use as a control? Well, whenever you have a control, you don't put any of the experimental change into it. Our experimental change in this experiment is cutting open that plasmid and putting ligating in the gene of interest. So our control is plasmid that has not been cut, some original plasmid. Okay, and you see that, so I'll give you a second to write that down, some plasmid that has not been cut, and I'm gonna erase the ink so that you can see on the slide, this control here, this is plasmid that was never cut, okay? So the, multi, the multiple cloning site is still there. The lac Z has never been cut. So what do you see in the end? You expect blue colonies, okay? So control, you expect only blue colonies. And remember, again, just like in the transformation we did, you'll only see blue colonies when the plate has X-gal, okay? So remind yourself, 
on Xgal plates. If there's no Xgal, you're not going to see any blue. Then this side of the picture represents the experimental group. Okay, experimental group. And with the experimental group, you have cut open the plasmid and you're trying to ligate in the DNA fragments, which are the gene of interest. So for instance, maybe insulin gene you're trying to put in. Okay, now like we said, what can happen is either the vector can take in that gene of interest, which is now interrupted. It interrupts beta-galactosidase, so I'll just write beta-gal, or it re-ligated on itself. So beta-gal is fine, okay? So if the gene of interest properly ligated, then what do you see? You see white colonies on the plate, and any of the re-ligated will give blue colonies. So the experimental group, what you actually end up expecting to see is you expect blue and white colonies on the same plate. The blue ones are re-ligated. Okay, blue are the re-ligated plasmids. And the white are the successful, the successful ligations. The gene of interest is present. Okay, so again, just because it got a little messy, I'll write one more time to remind you that white colonies, gene of interest, successfully ligated into that plasmid. Blue colonies are the plasmids that re-ligated self. And that's in the experimental group. In the control group, you'll only see blue or you only expect to see blue because that plasmid was never cut. It kept the beta-galactosidase gene fully active, okay? So again, don't get yourself mixed up that previously blue colonies were the success, but in this experiment, blue colonies are not a success. That means that you did not get your gene of interest into the plasmid, okay? White colonies are the success. Circle, star, highlight that fact, okay? White colonies are successful, blue are not successful colonies. So if you were doing this experiment, you would then collect the white colonies and do further experiments with them because they have the gene of interest. So now I just wanted to give you a chance to see what the protocol actually looks like. It's funny because you probably expect some crazy complicated protocol when you think of ligation because it sounds so complicated, but ultimately all you're really doing is combining plasmid and the cut pieces of DNA fragments, and you're allowing them to incubate together with some ligase, which you have added in the first step, okay? So notice the ligase, we said before, it needs ATP, and what's in that buffer? What else does it need? Magnesium, okay? So you have your ligase, you combine your DNA gene of interest with your plasmid and you let it incubate. Okay, so now once that DNA and the plasmid have been given a chance to incubate, you then move on to transformation. And the reason I included these, these slides on transformation 
is to remind you that you are also responsible for the information on transformation that we worked with previously, because I told you transformation is an experiment that comes back a lot. You use it in a lot of different techniques. So I'm going to run through this slide very quickly, but if you need to review more, then just go back to our lesson that we had recently on transformation, okay? Because this is all repeat information. Now, reminder, remember we said transformation is simply the uptake of naked DNA into bacteria from their surrounding environment. And the purpose of it is to get new genes into that bacteria so that bacteria makes a ton of copies for us. Now, in order to do this, we usually want the vector or the plasmid to have four main features. We said we wanted it to be small to easily get into the bacteria. We want the vector to have an origin of replication so that it can replicate on its own and so that it can be maintained in the bacteria. We also want the vector or the plasmid to have a selectable marker, which can be things like antibiotic resistance or color changes. And lastly, we said that we wanted the vector to have at least one endonuclease recognition site because you want to be able to cut open that plasmid to then be able to ligate in whatever genes you want. It allows us to manipulate the plasmid. Now we're gonna go through the key steps to remind you of the key steps and the reasons for each steps, but rather than boring you, you with it on this slide, we're gonna go through it briefly with the protocol itself, the real protocol you would have been using in today's blue and white transformation uh, experiment for insertional inactivation. Okay, stop everything. We have made it to the Surprise Remind app question. You are so used to these now, it doesn't even surprise you anymore. What I want you to do is in the Remind app, so right now pause the video and contact me in the Remind app. Let me know, in addition to transformation, what were the other two methods of gene transfer that we mentioned when I first taught you about transformation? And in addition to tell, telling me the names of those gene transfer methods, I also want you to tell me briefly what each one means. And again, when you tell me about anything like this, please stick to the lessons I gave you. Do not just Google and try and send me a response like that because Google answers do not count. Okay, then you can continue on with the video. Thank you. So now looking at this protocol, some things to remind you. Uh, as you can see, the first step, remember calcium chloride incubation. And the reason for that, we had previously said very important step, I'll even put stars next to it. Calcium chloride is what creates the ionic bridge. Okay, because remember, we said DNA was negative, cell membrane negative, so the calcium chloride provides the positive charge to link them together. Okay, and during the incubation on ice over here, you're basically letting the positive charges coat the cell and then letting the plasma DNA coat that, okay? Now, you also have over here, that step is the heat shock step. Okay, that's the heat shock. And the point of that, we said, was to open pores. Okay, get DNA in, into the bacteria. You then had, I'll change color since it's getting a little crammed, you then have place the sample on ice. That was to close the pores, okay? Then another very important step, the nutrient rich step, we said that was, what was that for? So that the bacteria could then transcribe and translate the new genes, okay? Time to transcribe and translate, meaning make the proteins, 
the new genes, okay? Which will then protect the sample when you streak on the selective media, okay? And when you look at this protocol, again, remind yourself what you expect to see on the ligation plate. So the ligation plate, you expect to see blue and white. And on the control, you expect to only see blue. Okay, and remind yourself that the white colonies are the ones you're looking for. Those are your successful colonies. That shows not only did the bacteria take in the plasmid, which you know based on seeing ampicillin resistance, but it also has the gene of interest. Okay, and the reason it's white, why is that? because the gene of interest stuck itself right smack in the middle of the beta-galactosidase gene. Okay, again, if you have any questions, you're unsure of any of this, please let me know in the Remind app. So once you have done all of that, you now understand the background, you understand the protocol, now you would have hopefully gotten your results. Uh, as these results, I'm not going to go over them because that'll be your job in the post lab, but this plate here, this is plate A, and notice any of these circles that you're seeing, these are colonies. Look to see what color they are, how they differ from each other, and then look at plate B and notice what results you see on here. If you are uncertain of what you are seeing, as I ask the questions in the post lab, please make sure to contact me because being able to analyze these results, you know, tell me what they mean, why they look this way, you know, whether it's a success, what colonies you would actually use in the next steps, you know, being able to answer these things is very important, okay? Research science, it's not just about being able to follow a protocol, it's being able to understand what the protocol means and what the results mean, okay? That is it for today. As always, please contact me in the Remind app with any questions you may have if you want me to help you review any information or to go through any kind of practice, just let me know. I'm always here to help. Thank you and have a great day.